In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's the 4th of July this weekend, which means a lot of flags, a lot of anthems, maybe some pledges of allegiance, a lot of talk about loyalty and grat gratitude to this nation, prayers of thanks for it, maybe, references aplenty to it being a particularly blessed nation, I suspect you'll hear. So it seems like a good day, not that there's a bad day, to talk about the kingdom of God. We do talk about the kingdom every Sunday. Thy kingdom come is the first thing we pray for specifically in the Lord's Prayer. The Nicene Creed said this very day by hundreds of millions around this globe and by us in a few moments proclaims that Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and that his kingdom will have no end. The idea that the Christian life, that all of the church's history, that every word of Christ is pointed toward a moment that is not here yet, is in the very architecture of our faith. So we talk about the kingdom of God often. We talk of it. But I confess I wonder sometimes if we spend enough time talking about it. Which is a hard thing to do. I mean, what do you hear in these ancient words? Thy kingdom come, judging the living and the dead and a kingdom without end. What do you hear in them? Do you envision kind of left behind novel style, Christ reigning over the earth as a literal king after an apocalyptic sorting of the saved and the damned? Is it more of a utopia? A kingdom not all that different from this one, but with all the kinks worked out of it? without poverty and racism and violence and universal health care and protected voting rights and bike lanes everywhere? <laughs> Is it just the same old beloved us, but like better, a personal inward transformation into the people we long to be, that we think God longs for us to be? And who brings it about? You? All of us? God? There are traditions and theologies in the church for all of the above. You can take your pick, but we're waiting for something. But the challenge in praying for the kingdom of God is that kind of like trying to imagine a new color. Our vision is limited by what we have already seen. Just as I cannot expand my spectrum of vision beyond the eyes I have, it is difficult to pray in a concrete way for power without corruption or fear for life without the trappings that I've known, for freedom and justice without the structures that enforce those things at great and sinful cost. It is not so easy to know, maybe, whether we hope for God's kingdom or our own. To complicate matters further, the Gospels say a lot of things that don't always go together about the kingdom of God. The phrase kingdom of God gets almost a hundred references in the Synoptic Gospels, which is more than specific references to love or peace or justice or money. Not that those are separate concepts, put a pin in that thought. And yet the Gospel texts, trying as they do to explain the kingdom of God to people who have only known earthly kings, run up against the same problem. The Gospel authors can't really get their point across by saying that the kingdom of God will be like the not-so-great kingdoms we have now, or the empire that you suffer under right now, but like better, we promise. What they can do is use images to unsettle our intuitions. In Luke's Gospel alone, from which we heard a portion this morning, Jesus has much to say about who will inherit the kingdom of God. The poor those who receive it like little children, those whose hearts are good soil rather than rock, those who are watchful and faithful, those who enter through the narrow door, and those who humble themselves. We hear also who will not inherit the kingdom of God, one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back in hesitation, as our gospel last week told us, those who store up treasure on earth rather than in heaven, those who cling to their life rather than surrendering it. In other words, me or probably most of them. We hear, too, how the kingdom of God will come to us in surprising and bizarre ways. 
It will come, we are told, like a mustard seed that grows into a tree, like yeast that leavens bread, and also that it cannot be observed as an event. We are told that it will be like light uncovered from beneath a bushel. And the timing. We hear that the kingdom of God is at hand, that it is already here among us, but also not yet. We hear Jesus tell the disciples that some of them will not taste death before the coming of the kingdom. We hear the thief, one cross over from Jesus, ask him to remember me when you come into your kingdom. And we hear Jesus, with the penultimate words of his earthly ministry, reply that today you will be with me in paradise. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is far and right on top of us, and it seems sometimes like it's nowhere at all. So by twists and turns, poetry and paradox, we hear the who, the how, the when, and the why of the kingdom. But if you're looking for the what, the like just straight up, right from Jesus' mouth, what is the kingdom of God? You'll be frustrated. It's not there. Not easy, not black and white. Which is why I think our gospel text for today is so vitally, vitally important. Because I think it is maybe one of the few places in the Synoptic Gospels where we can glimpse a direct answer to that question, what is the kingdom of God? There's a lot going on in our text for today, Jesus sending out the 70 followers. So it's easy to miss it. Back at the beginning, he sends them in pairs to the places that he himself intended to go. And he's very particular, as is Jesus' want, about exactly how this is to be done. No money, no spare clothes, no shoes, and with instructions to not stop and speak with anybody lest they tarry in reaching their destination. And there, they are told, they should rely entirely on the hospitality of those who had heard and would accept Jesus, for shelter and survival. This is a dangerous thing that they do. It's not for nothing that Jesus says, I am sending you as lambs among wolves. And what are they to do once they get there? Are they to fix the world? Are they to stir up rebellion, cast down the mighty, to multiply food for the poor? Are they to get into disputes with religious authorities and local rulers? Are they to build the kingdom of God one village at a time? No, they are given an almost comically minimalist job description. Step one, proclaim the peace of the Lord, which is to say to proclaim that the salvation of Christ is at hand. And then if step one goes well, step two, plan A, is to heal the sick and cast out demons. Awesome, right? And if step one goes not so well, step two, plan B, is to leave Jesus' equivalent of a zero-star Yelp, uh, Yelp review, <laughs> kicking the dust of the town off their bare feet so that not a drop of it would accompany his followers back to Jesus. But the curious thing, to me at least, is that whether step two is plan A or plan B, whether it's heroic miracles and healing or abject condemnation, step three is the same. Jesus' followers are told to say to them, whatever happens, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Whether you are healed or left exactly as you were, plan A or plan B, the kingdom of God has come near to you. To which a reasonable person would ask, what? Or maybe more precisely, why? I mean, if nothing changes, if there is no result, if nothing is better than the disciples found it, what is the point? If whatever was on offer by their presence has been rejected out of hand, if demons and darkness and death still rule, then what kind of kingdom is this? One of my only regrets in life so far is that I didn't take Greek in divinity school. I've kicked myself for that decision almost weekly since, not least of all because most things in the body have Greek names and it'd be really helpful. 
<laughs> but smart people I know who took many, many semesters of Greek assure me that the word that is translated as kingdom, the basileia, is perhaps more usefully read as reign, the reign of God. At least in English, that unlocks something for me. The image of the word kingdom suggests stasis, a realm with boundaries to be defended and pageantry and demonstrations of power. The reign of God, though, there's sort of a simplicity and elegance to it. What if there are no thrones or trumpets or triumphs? Especially then, who do you trust? Who do you obey? Who do you love? To whom do you surrender your whole fearful longing heart? What truth do you let rule there instead? The thing that unites plan A and B, the thing that they have in common, it seems to me, isn't the result. It's Jesus' followers. It's them. They are sent out with nothing. They are told they may accomplish nothing and receive nothing. But in their presence, in their willingness to go at all, to speak truth and to follow Christ in the first place, we glimpse a quiet and abiding reign of God. And thus, wherever they go, the kingdom has come near. This is what Jesus is getting at when the amazed followers return to him, just dumbstruck by what they could accomplish, the demons they could cast out. And Jesus says, that wasn't you casting out the demons. That was me. You are in me and I am in you. United to him, it is Christ who moves and acts. In following Christ and allowing God's will to become their will, his trust, their trust, they brought the kingdom near to themselves and thus into the world and among God's people. The kingdom of God comes near to the people because Christ's reign, if only in them, has come near to them. If you take absolutely nothing away, from this sermon. I cannot stress enough that I am not talking about a consolation prize or some empty moral victory. This is not a warm, fuzzy, well, the real kingdom was in you all along kind of pat on the back. Christ didn't seek power. He sought us. He did not come with an army to build a new nation, but a body to give up for us. We're it. We're the whole shebang, the big enchilada. It's us. The difference between this tiny kingdom ensconced in mortal flesh and the kingdom that we await is a difference of mere scale and time, not of essence. If Christ reigns in even one heart, the kingdom of God is among us still. That may not feel like enough, I suspect. It doesn't for me some days. I don't think I need to enumerate from this pulpit the ways in which we live in urgent and precarious times. The kingdoms of the world are failing if they're not setting about, out, setting about with outright evil. I'm not sure that's really new, but maybe it's more apparent to us now. So what good is the kingdom of God in us, we might ask, if the forest still burns, if the oceans still rise? and blood runs in the streets. Don't we need to build our own kingdom faster? Now, do not get me at all wrong here. There is nothing wrong, not a thing, with seeking to change the world and right its wrongs. As St. Paul's letter to the Galatians reminded us today, we should never grow weary of doing what is right and working for the good of all. That is a holy obligation. But I wish I could tell you that if we just raise our voices louder, really put our shoulders into it, organize harder, we could build the kingdom of justice. But evil is resilient, and the days are long past when the church held special power to organize against it, I'm sorry to say. When people in collars could stand in front of a protest and stop tear gas and rubber bullets. When bishops could pick up a phone and speak to presidents and stop missiles from flying. The world has always been a dangerous, precarious place in the gospel times as much as now. And there will, I fear, be more grief, more loss, more death, 
maybe more, maybe less, until the coming of the kingdom. And even if we could melt every handgun, suck every molecule of carbon from the atmosphere, if we could house and clothe everyone who lacks those things, we would still be a nation of people, not the kingdom of God. And there would still be a gospel to preach, because the world isn't ours to save. This is my last sermon here for a good long while, at any rate. Many things are in flux, and this community itself will undergo transition and with it transformation. It pains me a little that I won't get to walk that with you. But if I have to sum up in one last sermon, leave you with one thing, I do it like this. The church can and ought to be many things. We, as the people of God, can and ought to be many things. But the one thing the church and we absolutely must be is the place where one can hear and see and know that the kingdom of God is in the midst of the world, whatever other kingdoms rise and fall. It absolutely must be that place, and we must be that people who will wade into destruction and death without a plan or a vision or a means of resurrection and whisper, the kingdom of God is near. That is our only true treasure, for we are Christ's one true treasure. So is the kingdom of God close at hand or miles off? Is it within, among, or without us? Yes, and yes, and yes. And yes. But amid those swirling truths, what matters is that it's also right here. We cannot give what we don't have. That is what we are doing here. That is what all these prayers, all this liturgy, all this gathering, all of this love is for. Uniting ourselves to Christ and letting the Lord, died and resurrected, reign in us now, tomorrow, and the next day. Come, behold what you are, become what you receive. The kingdom of God draws near. Amen.